Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Welcome to today's Kubernetes Masterclass session. Thanks a lot for tuning in. We are continuing with our Cloud Native at Scale series. And um, as usual, we're going to give it a minute or two for other people to get settled. In the meantime, if you're already online, please do um, say hello. Uh, greet uh, everyone in the that's tuning into this particular session. If you're comfortable with it, please let us know uh, where you're tuning in from as well. We just want to know um, if we have a great distribution or a rather great variety of people from different parts of the globe. Uh, I see Tim just posted over there. Nice background. Thank you very much. Um, Iron Man is uh, one of my favorite superheroes. He's in my top five. So yeah, totally fitting. Great. And we can see over there we got um, Dax from Atlanta, GA, I think that's Atlanta, Georgia. We got David from Mexico. How are you doing, David? I remember you tuned into yesterday's introduction to Kubernetes class. Uh, nice to see you again. Got um, Gerard from Switzerland. You got Gerald from Pretoria, South Africa. Awesome. Gerald, how are you doing, man? I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, or is it Gerald? Um, I'm also in South Africa and Johannesburg to be specific. Awesome. This is great. We've got people across the globe. I love to see this. Uh, so everyone, just in case you're not aware, we do have an active poll, um, or rather active polls. Uh, so please do check that out. I'd love to get to see some feedback just to gauge um, the level of experience or the context of the different people that are tuning in. Um, please let us know if you are currently managing multiple Kubernetes clusters in your particular context. In addition to that, I think there's also a poll just asking uh, what you find most challenging about uh, Kubernetes security. And if you don't have experience with, um, if you don't have a lot of experience with Kubernetes rather, and you haven't actually um, even reached a stage where you know what it means to be carrying out host hardening or cluster hardening, et cetera, feel free to just tech, uh, select the option, which is no idea I'm new to Kubernetes as a whole. That is totally fine. In which case I will also just state that we do have a free introduction to Kubernetes class. Uh, we had one just yesterday and we've got another one that will be coming up next week on the 18th of October. So please tune into that session. It really does help you get the most out of these particular sessions, just so you have a lot more context and you're covered in terms of the fundamentals or the basics and you don't have to be scratching your head, but that's not to chase you away at all. Um, you're more than welcome to be a part of this, um, regardless of where you are on the learning spectrum. Great, looks like the number of people that are tuning in is going up. So once again, please do say hello. I we'll wanna know where you're tuning in from. Um, it'd be nice to see more people uh, from, I don't think I've seen anyone from Australia. We've got one person from Africa. Well, actually we have two, we have myself and Gerald. Oh, we've got uh, another person from India. That's great to see. I think it's Abhirami, how are you doing? Um, I wonder what time it is in your particular side of the world right now. We've got Simon, hey Simon, how are you doing? Uh, Simon is a faithful person that tunes into these sessions and is extremely helpful in many cases as well. Awesome from Cambridge. Okay, great. So I'm just going to give it another minute before we actually get started. But once again, to everyone, thank you very much for tuning into the session. We are continuing with our uh, cloud native at scale series. Uh, so we're not just looking at optimizing our Kubernetes administration for a single Kubernetes cluster. We're wondering how would that play out in an enterprise context when you're managing multiple Kubernetes clusters and the different aspects of the cloud native landscape, that, uh, or rather the different things that you should be considering um, that people might typically overlook. And so we've been on this journey for a couple of weeks now, and uh, today we're going to be dealing with uh, security, which we were dealing with last week as well, because we touched on security and observability, and we had the team from Tigera uh, join us. Um, and so today we're going to be exploring different aspects of security as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, switch over to my slide deck. But just before I do that, I do want to let everyone that is on the call know from the from the get go. At the moment in South Africa, there are a couple of scheduled or sporadic power outages. In fact, I had one yesterday during the introduction to Kubernetes class and I was offline for about nine minutes. I just want you to know that I do have a failover system. So my backup power is in place in case that that happens. However, yesterday I also had a network disruption and that one is a little more unpredictable. But I just want you to know that there is backup. So if I happen to go offline in that particular case, um, please do uh, try and give it a couple of minutes and I'll, I'll definitely try my best to get back online. And if it's for a very extended period and that's not suitable for you, then please feel free to, to drop off. Once again, uh, these sessions are recorded. That is our most popular question. So uh, just so you're aware, it will be available on demand. So if you're not able to sit in for the entire 
duration. That is totally cool. You can still come and access it later from this exact same link. And I'll just let you know as well that there is a dedicated ask a question section. So please pop your questions there because if you put them in the chat, um, it's uh, very easy for us to miss them because there's going to be continuous feed in there. And I do encourage everyone to engage in the chat section. Say hello. Um, if someone does pop a question in there and I don't have visibility of it, especially during the actual presentation or the session uh, as it's running, then feel free to actually respond to it if you do know the answer. Um, you know, you don't have to exclusively rely on me for those responses. Uh, we definitely encourage a community and um, a community oriented approach to doing things together and working uh, towards um, working towards uh, reaching our destination together. All right. So I'm going to switch over to my slide deck now. I'm going to proceed to share my screen. Let me get rid of that this message. Great. So at this point, you should be seeing the main heading Kubernetes masterclass managing cluster security at scale. Once again, welcome to today's session. Thank you so much for making time and tuning into it. This is a very important topic, which goes without saying. And some of you know that uh, we did have a security focused session last week as well, security and observability. And we had a team from Tigera join us. We had Joseph and Nigel, and um, it was an absolutely excellent session. And we touched on a couple of different things and how you can make use of Calico Cloud uh, to achieve security of your work of your workloads in the Kubernetes context, as well as the underlying host. And we also had a great bring it on with Luke session and Joseph joined us for that dedicated Q&A um, time together. Uh, in today's session, though, we're going to be uh, trying to broaden things a little bit more and explore the different aspects of how to secure your Kubernetes cluster. And so um, some of you might be thinking, well, I thought we're currently addressing applications at scale. And you're correct. And so cluster security is something that kind of actually fits into different dimensions of cloud native at scale. And so it could easily have slotted into the four main dimensions that we're going to be exploring. But the most important thing is that we actually do touch on it. Some of you might feel a little bit shortchanged by the end of the session, feeling like, man, I felt like we could have delved deeper into certain things. The reality is this is a massive topic and uh, there's so much uh, that we could uh, address, but we only have so much time. And so we're trying to make sure that we at least provide excellent, high quality content and touch on a number of important things that you can still go away feeling like there was a lot of value from it and you've been pointed in the right direction. So as usual, uh, my name is Lakonde Mwila or Luke Mwila, and I'm the instructor for the session. I'm a senior technical evangelist here at SUSE, and I'm a part of the SUSE and Rancher community team. Please feel free to connect with me either in the SUSE and Rancher community, uh, that particular network. You can either send me a direct message or feel free to connect with me um, either through an article or a quick post or whatever uh, particular session that I may be running. Um, in addition to that, you can feel free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, in which case you'd probably have to use my full name, which is Lakonde Mwila. But I'd love to hear from you and I'd love for us to connect and see how we can learn from each other. Uh, I should also just note that the SUSE and Rancher community, in case you're not a part of it, is an excellent space for cloud native enthusiasts and practitioners. So what we'll be talking about in today's session doesn't have to end here. Let's definitely carry the conversation over um, into that particular space. So what do we have lined up for you today? Uh, so for starters, we're just going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes and security in general, just for a few minutes. Uh, and that's just going to pave the way for the different things that we're going to be exploring or touching on. And then we'll start looking at host hardening, cluster hardening. We'll take a short break to do some Q&A, and I'll just address a few questions in this segment. Um, this um, midway Q&A is typically shorter than the, the one we have at the end. So if you find that your question doesn't get addressed at this point, then not to worry. We'll definitely try and make time for it at the end, provided that we do have time. In which case, if any questions aren't addressed right at the end, we definitely try to, we encourage people to pop those questions in the community so that we can uh, continue the conversation over there. In addition to that, we also still have access to them um, on this particular session, even afterwards, and we can um, address them in the comments section. And I'll point, it, I'll point it out again as well, that if you know the answer to a particular question, hey, feel free to engage and pop it in the comments section as well. The last two items that we'll cover are secret and certificate management, and then cluster security and conformance. 
So if you have joined some of our previous Crowdcast webinars or training sessions, then this might be a little bit of a bore to you, but we always try to cater for the fact that there are people who might be brand new to these sessions. So here's just a little bit of administration of how to uh, how we try to engage on these Crowdcast sessions. For starters, we encourage you to ask questions at any point, but we do ask that you would ask your questions in the ask a question section in the bottom right. Um, if you do see that someone has popped a question in the chat and they missed this particular segment of the session, please encourage them to add it to the ask a question section, or you can even add it for them. If you see that someone has already asked a question that you wanted to ask, excuse me, please feel free to upvote it. And uh, that way we don't need to have unnecessary repetition. Once again, be on the lookout for polls. We currently have two that are active, and that's just a nice way to try and enhance the engagement uh, and to personalize a little bit more uh, and bridge the gaps between myself and you out there. Uh, just a way of connecting to know what you're dealing with in your current context. Are you managing multiple Kubernetes cluster in your clusters in your context? Um, in addition to that, what have you found to be the most challenging aspects um, of security? Uh, when it comes to optimizing your Kubernetes clusters. And if you're brand new to Kubernetes and you don't even understand some of the terms that are being thrown around there, like host hardening or cluster hardening or certificates and secrets, that's totally fine. You can um, just pop that option over there and um, please feel free to engage as well. Lastly, our most important um, question that comes up of the comes up in these sessions is just people inquiring whether or not the sessions are being recorded. And yes, they are. It will be available to you on demand afterwards. So as I said a few minutes back, um, we are still in our series cloud native at scale, but it's very important to note that if you haven't tuned into any of the previous sessions, you shouldn't feel like you will be hindered from getting any value out of this particular one. We have designed them uh, in such a way that you can join a single session and it is standalone to the point that you can get a lot of value out of it in and of itself. Um, that being said, it does fit within a bigger picture or a journey, which is operating at scale or cloud native at scale. And these are the four different dimensions that I was talking about just a few minutes back. And the four different dimensions are cluster management at scale, applications at scale, utilization at scale, and deployments at scale. And we are currently in the applications at scale section. Uh, but as I said earlier as well, some of you might get a little confused and say, shouldn't managing your clusters securely at scale fit into the top dimension? And you're right, but the reality is when it comes to securing your Kubernetes clusters, that's something that's going to fit into several different dimensions. There is an aspect of cluster management at scale in that there's securing your applications. There's also making uh, use of um, different uh, components to secure uh, your clusters from a utilization perspective or even uh, deployments as well. So the important thing is to make sure that we actually cover it. If you do want to access some of our previous uh, sessions in this particular series, then they are they have been uploaded to YouTube. There is a cloud native at scale uh, playlist on the Rancher Labs uh, YouTube channel. In addition to that, you can access any of the previous Crowdcast sessions by registering for the events, even if they are in the past and you can access them on demand. In fact, the more recent ones are only available on Crowdcast, so please feel free to access them in that way as well. All right, so now that we've got the administration out of the way, we can go ahead and get started with our session. And like I said before, we're just going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes and security in general. So this might come as a little bit of a surprise to some, but Kubernetes, even though it's robust, it is complex, it is intelligent in so many different ways and has a lot of different moving parts, is not the most secure system by default. And so if you were planning on simply lifting and shifting the default configurations that you have for your Kubernetes cluster in a local context, or perhaps even in a cloud environment or on-prem, but the one that you've been working on for development purposes, and you wanna take that over to production, I'd encourage you to pump the brakes. You should definitely halt right there. Kubernetes is uh, has a very large attack surface area. There are so many different components that you need to consider uh, when it comes to securing your Kubernetes cluster. And the best way of going about that is by first identifying or understanding what the points of vulnerability are. And from there, you understand what the solutions are for those points of vulnerability. And then the next step is obviously to apply them. And in the context of what we're dealing with in this series, which is cloud native at scale, it's not just about optimizing a single Kubernetes cluster. We want to find the best way of doing that for multiple Kubernetes clusters, which is the usual model that enterprises will be going with in a, or rather that organizations, 
organizations will be going with in an enterprise context. You'll be working with multiple Kubernetes clusters. If it so happens that in your context you're dealing with one, you'll still be able to get a lot of benefit out of this particular session. And so we're going to look at some of the key areas that you want to be considering for optimizing um, your security, the security posture of your Kubernetes cluster or clusters. And so the things we'll be looking at are the hosts, uh, the different cluster components. We're going to look at authentication and authorization and workloads as well. And so that being said, I hope that has helped um, at least paint a picture for you on why you need to be considering security optimization for your Kubernetes clusters. It is very important. By default, Kubernetes is not secure. And if you're intending to make use of Kubernetes in a production environment, there are a number of different components across the board that would fit within the framework of your Kubernetes cluster that have different levels of vulnerabilities and that all contribute to the general surface area of attack for your cluster. And you need to know what those vulnerabilities are what the solutions are for those vulnerabilities and how to apply that in a scalable way. So we're gonna start off with the most basic building block. Whether your Kubernetes cluster is running on a single host or multiple hosts, you still have to deal with hosts, right? So whether it's a Raspberry Pi or you have virtual machines in the cloud or you have servers um, on-prem, you need to understand um, the best things that you can put into practice in order to secure the host that your Kubernetes cluster is running on. And so we're gonna start off by considering a couple of operating system configurations. And so some things that you wanna be thinking about in terms of the operating system that is actually running on the different uh, virtual machines or the different devices um, is to make sure that you have some kind of system in place for operating system updates. And the most important aspect of this is not just for having the latest and greatest features of your operating system, but actually, especially, um, you wanna make sure that you have the updates that would complement Kubernetes um, and security patches, because the more secure that your operating system is, uh, the better off your underlying hosts will be. So make sure you have a system in place for this. And by system, I also mean a way of tracking the latest updates. Uh, for that particular operating system you're making use of. And this will depend on whether you're running things on-prem or you're running things in the cloud, but you need to understand the relevant responsibility that your operators have or your infrastructure engineers as it pertains to the operating system and making sure that they have those things in place. In addition to that, you want to make sure that you don't lock down your application developers to be using a specific operating system version because that basically blocks you from achieving the first item that I just mentioned. You want to make sure especially that you have the best or the latest features that would be complementing Kubernetes as a system. And in addition to that, security patches for vulnerabilities that exist on the particular OS. Another very important one, and to some of you who are very experienced with Kubernetes, this one might come as a no-brainer. You want to prevent access to root file systems. So make sure that the applications that are going to be running on these hosts are going to be running in containers and that those containers only have the right kind of access that they need. You don't want to have any particular applications that would uh, potentially modify the operating system. You want to mitigate those risks from malicious software or applications. So make sure that your applications are running as containers and that they have the right kind of access and not necessarily root level privileges to your root file system um, to modify the operating system. In addition to that, um, there is making sure that your operating system has um, the kinds of features that would support or complement, as I mentioned earlier, Kubernetes networking features and security monitoring tools. So you want to be considering things like eBPF as well. And those are things that would be complementing some of uh, the excellent and newer um, features of Kubernetes networking as well. So this is very important. And these are typically the things that some people might overlook because they're rushing to consider a different component or different aspect. But Kubernetes security is about considering the different components or pieces at their different levels. And so we're starting with the basic building block over here, and we're considering the hosts themselves and the operating system that is um, the operating systems that are running on those particular hosts, because that in and of itself as well is a surface area for attack if you don't put the, re the relevant measures in place. So now that we've considered our hosts, there's another thing that we want to take a look at. Uh, we want to look at the networking configurations for these particular hosts. Once again, whether you're running your Kubernetes cluster on-prem or in the context of a cloud environment, it is very important to make sure that you have the right kinds of firewall configurations in place. So that will be how you determine which ports are open or exposed 
um, for ingress and egress traffic. So basically make sure you have the right ingress and egress rules in place. And there's a lot of documentation, not only on the Rancher uh, website, but also on the Kubernetes website and a number of other excellent resources or articles out there that um, have made it clear the kinds of um, the ports that you should be making use of in order for communication across the board of your Kubernetes cluster. So that is between the control plane and the worker plane and make sure that those port configurations are the same ones that you're putting into play. And once again, these are universal, so to say, uh, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. So make sure you're making the most of those. Don't leave things open-ended for ingress and egress. This is very important for the host configurations. So just a, just a, touch base on what we've covered so far with host hardening, consider the operating system um, considerations as well as the networking considerations um, for uh, your hosts that your Kubernetes cluster will be running on. Very important aspect, and this is kind of working our way up, starting from the ground and heading upwards. So the next thing, which will be a little bit more detailed is cluster hardening in and of itself. So now we've taken it a level up and we're gonna be focusing on Kubernetes itself. And as you know, Kubernetes consists of three different planes. There is the control plane, the worker plane and the data plane. And um, inside of these different planes, there are different things that we wanna be taking into consideration and how we can secure our Kubernetes cluster. And so the different things that we're going to take a look at in this particular session are the different components. So as I've said, the different planes and how we can secure those main components. In addition to that, we're going to take a look at configuration management. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about secrets and certificates and some secure ways of managing those things. We're also going to look at um, authentication and role-based access control. So that touches more on the cluster personas. Who is accessing your Kubernetes cluster? What are their permissions and how do you manage all of that? So this will be security within the context of the Kubernetes cluster, um, as well as configuration at, at a configuration level in terms of the applications or workloads uh, running on your Kubernetes clusters. And in addition to that, there is the authentication and RBAC. So that is especially useful for cluster personas. And cluster personas doesn't just apply to users, but also um, how to make sure that your pods are making access, uh, or rather your pods have the permissions to do what you want them to do in a secure way. So let's start off with securing the API server and the other cluster components. And so this will be, uh, we're gonna pay a little bit of attention to the control plane uh, because this is what's, uh, this is essentially the brains behind the, all oper the whole operation and arguably um, one of the two uh, that most important pieces being the control plane and the data plane. Now the API server is the central component of the control plane. Some of you that have tuned into my introduction to Kubernetes class will be aware that I often uh, speak about how the API server is the main component or the hub for your Kubernetes cluster because all the CRUD based operations go through it. And by CRUD, I'm referring to create, read, update, and delete. So any API requests to bring about a certain state um, in your Kubernetes cluster, whether it originates inside of the cluster itself or from outside of the cluster with a kubectl command that some operator may be running, it will all have to go through the API server. So you want to make sure that that is secure. And the way to secure the API server is to make use of public key infrastructure certificates for authentication over uh, TLS, which is transport layer security. And so you're essentially going to be making use of tools that help you to generate certificates to make sure that there is authentication between the different pieces. And so you want to make sure that the API server is able to identify every single entity that is making a request to it and vice versa. So this is very important. And the nice thing is a number of uh, different tools or platforms that help you spin up a Kubernetes cluster uh, may come with uh, means to help you streamline this particular process, but there are also other tools, and I'll give a couple of examples later on to assist you with this. But what you need to keep in mind over here is that the goal is to ensure that all the cluster components have the required keys and certificates for secure communication across the board. The API server needs to know who it is talking to. So that is very important. And remember that the control plane consists of other important components, uh, such as the scheduler as well. And so you also wanna make sure that that is secure as well. And then there's also the controller, which, can, which takes care of other sub controllers. So these different pieces inside of the control plane are very important and each one of them will be interacting or engaging with the, with the API server in the control plane. And you wanna make sure that the communication um, in transit um, is all secured and encrypted. In addition to that, 
we also have our worker plane, which is where our nodes are. And what is very important about the nodes is that each of them has a kubelet, which is an agent that communicates with the API server. So that means that your certificates will also need to be generated in order to ensure that there is secure encrypted transmission between the kubelet on the nodes and the API server. So it is not just within the context of the control plane, but also from the worker plane to the API server. Now over here is a relatively comprehensive list that you can have a look at even on the official Kubernetes documentation. But the reason I included it over here is just to give you an idea of how comprehensive your communic or how comprehensive their certificate um, encryption should be between the different components. So as you can see over here, client certificates for the kubelet to authenticate to the API server, which is something that I just mentioned. And remember the kubelet is an agent that is running on the nodes um, and is communicating with the API server inside of the control plane. In addition to that, client certificates for the administrators of the cluster to authenticate to the API server. So that's um, all the people who are outside of the context of the cluster or real life uh, entities or users who are gonna be communicating with the API server. You wanna make sure that they are able to authenticate and have the relevant um, client certificates in that particular context. And there are a host of other items over here that are listed. But what, as I said, if you don't catch every single one of them <laughs> just in this short amount of time that we've had with this particular slide, that's totally fine. Um, the point over here is to help you understand that you want to make sure every bit of communication taking place with the API server, because it is the central component in your control plane, needs to be secured with PKI certificates. You wanna ensure that there's TLS communication across the board. Um, the next thing we're gonna look at is for the is at the data store. So some of you might've already been thinking, hey, we've spoken about the control plane, but what about, and we've spoken about the worker plane and communication with the API server, what about the data store? So a number of people would actually say that this, that um, this is the most prized possession and this is what you wanna ensure is very secure your data store and typically will be an etcd implementation, which is a key value database. So the data store is what has your cluster configuration and the desired state. Uh, a backup of this would essentially enable you to be able to spin up your Kubernetes cluster with the exact same configurations and the state uh, declarations that were in place. Now, it, sh it is very important to understand that in the case that there is a malicious actor that gains access to your etcd, they essentially have the keys to the kingdom. So you want to make sure that this is secured. Now, the benefit is that securing your etcd is very similar to securing your API server and the other uh, control plane components. You would be making use of PKI, PKI keys and certificates. And etcd actually already has security features built in that help you um, to optimize uh, this kind of security. And the main goal in this section is to make sure that there is secure data in transit between the different etcd nodes or instances. And some of you might be wondering why we have multiple etcd nodes or instances. Well, it is encouraged in the context of um, of production or production Kubernetes cluster to have high availability. It is a best practice. And by high availability, uh, you would have, for example, three etcd nodes. You want to have a quorum, an odd number in that particular case uh, to increase the redundancy level uh, for your data store. And um, so that's why you'll have multiple instances for your etcd. Now, because they're going to be communicating across the board to make sure that they come to a particular quorum and ensure that they're aligned in terms of the state configurations, you wanna make sure the communication taking place between your different etcd nodes is secure. Now, remember the etcd, um, your etcd layers is essentially a database so it has to be getting its data from somewhere and the etcd communicates with the api server which uh, we were just talking about so once again you want to make sure that the relevant um, security is in place over there so make sure that you have a set of credentials for the etcd nodes so that's the peer communication but you want to make sure that you have another set of credentials for communication between the api server um, communicating with the etcd node. So very important. So we've covered um, security from a control plane perspective, a worker plane perspective, and the data plane perspective as well, and how you'd be making use of PKI certificates. So this is very important to understand uh, from a cluster security perspective. Now, that's um, some of the main components. Uh, we're now like moving another level up uh, and at this point, we're actually going to be talking about something that would deal with both uh, workloads as well as the different users. 
And um, I put out a poll in one of the classes inside of the Susan Rancher community, uh, the up and running rancher class. And I was essentially asking people what they think is um, or what they think is the most challenging aspect of managing multiple Kubernetes clusters. So security was the one that topped it. Um, uh, the second one was actually managing uh, cluster personas or tenants. And believe it or not, these two uh, dimensions, security and cluster personas overlap in multiple ways. If anything, they, fall, they both fall under the umbrella of security. So now we're gonna focus a little bit on authentication and RBAC, and this is very important for both your workloads, as well as the people that have access to your Kubernetes cluster. Some of you might be familiar with how role-based access control works in the context of Kubernetes, and some of you may not. So please bear with me for uh, those of you who are familiar with it. I do think it's important to help others understand exactly how this works. Kubernetes does not have any, an internal system for keeping track of users. So you have to make use of an external system, which will map those users through to the RBAC um, mechanism or uh, methodology that Kubernetes makes use of to secure any of the API operations that will be taking place. And there are different um, external authentication uh, systems that you can use. And I will show you an example of that um, in the context of uh, around how Rancher helps that helps with that process in particular. Uh, but let's have a look at how role-based access control actually works. And so you have, as you can see over here, you've got roles and cluster roles, and then you have role bindings and cluster role bindings. So for starters, roles essentially will determine the operations that can be carried out um, on specific resources in the different API groups and for a specific namespace. So that is very important to understand. It is for it, it, the, uh, the scope of roles is for a particular namespace. Cluster roles, on the other hand, as the name implies, are for the scope of your entire Kubernetes cluster. So if you're going to be attaching any particular entity, whether it is an actual user or you want to give a pod um, access to the full scope of your Kubernetes cluster using a cluster role, make sure that you know exactly what you're doing and why you are doing it. And so roles and cluster roles can be used by both users as well as, um, uh, as, well as pods. Now, in case you're wondering how exactly do you attach users or pods to a particular role or a particular cluster role, you would make use of role bindings. So this is what is used to determine which users or service accounts are authorized to carry out the operations or resources in a given namespace specified in a specific role or cluster role. And at this point, I just want to make it very clear again. So for your pods, make sure that you are attaching them to a specific service account, which is essentially going to work as their identity. And that service account is what will be attached to a particular role binding, and a role binding will be attached to a specific role. And that way, you'll be able to control what a specific pod in a namespace will have access to carry out and the operations that it can carry out on the particular API server. This is very very important. In a similar way, you want to make sure that any users um, that are accessing your Kubernetes cluster um, are attached to a specific role. You want to make sure that there's clarity on the permissions that they have for what they can do in your Kubernetes cluster. Don't make things wide open, even though that is the easiest way of doing things. Now, it is also important to note that not every Kubernetes cluster comes with RBAC enabled. It's something that you actually have to set. Um, there are some uh, Kubernetes clusters, especially I think hosted clusters that typically come with RBAC enabled by default, which is great. Um, if you're working in a cluster and you're not too sure about that, make sure that you can actually that you actually check to see if RBAC is enabled because this is very important. This is how you secure your API server. And as I mentioned earlier, your API server is the central component or the hub for your Kubernetes cluster, which lives within the control plane. And um, before we proceed, I actually want to now switch over. And over here, I'm now in my browser. And I'm, I just I hope you can all see my screen. And I am inside of an instance of Rancher. Great, I'm still logged in. The reason I brought you here is because as I explain the different components of Kubernetes cluster security, and we're talking about how to actually carry this out at scale, um, I also want to model to you how Rancher helps you solve those problems at scale. So if you think about um, the same model of having multiple uh, cluster personas and several different people that are um, authenticating against your different downstream clusters that you're managing, you want to have an optimized way of actually managing the security from that particular perspective. And what Rancher offers you is a central place for you to have all of your users authenticate 
For those of you that have tuned into the first class of the Up and Running Rancher class, uh, you will be familiar with the particular component that I spoke about, which is the auth proxy running inside of the Rancher management cluster or the Rancher server. So all of the authentication goes through this particular gatekeeper. And this is an excellent and secure way of managing multiple uh, personas because now everyone has to go through this way, this particular approach. And so you'll have uh, rancher administrators that will essentially be able to specify permissions for the different uh, users. And you would simply come to the users and authentication section, as you can see over here under configuration, and you can create a cluster persona for particular users by simply creating their username, you give them a display name, uh, you can generate a password for them or uh, also set for them to have a new login after the first time they actually sign into their account. And what is really important is over here, you can see there's global permissions as well as built-in permissions. But bear in mind that all of these configurations that you're making through the GUI are essentially still manifest files. They are the Kubernetes configurations that you can download and have access to. And so this is still making use of central, this is essentially making use of centralized RBAC. So we're still making use of role-based access control. And this is very important and very helpful because this way you can fine tune uh, the different people that are going to be uh, working on different applications or depending on what their role is, if they're actually more of DevOps roles, then you want to make sure that you narrow down what they're able to do on the different downstream clusters as they carry out the different things um, using Rancher as your main, uh, essentially the, the gatekeeper for all of your downstream clusters. And you'll remember that I was also speaking about authentication and external um, systems that you can use that can be mapped to your Kubernetes clusters. Well, um, Rancher also offers you um, access to different authentication providers, which is excellent. Uh, some of you might be working in an enterprise context where there's already existing authentication systems in place. And so instead of having a brand new authentication system that you need to create, you can essentially leverage those such as Microsoft's Active Directory or Azure's Active Directory, as you can see over here. There's also Google Authentication, Okta, GitHub, Ping Identity, and a couple of other ones as well. So this is excellent because you can essentially make use of this um, making use of those same authentication credentials that you already have in your enterprise's uh, directory, and they'll be mapped through as your identification on your uh, Kubernetes cluster, and Rancher will be able to uh, communicate with that respective um, directory to make sure that you are who you say you are, and then it will proceed to work on the permission side of things to see if you actually have the permissions to carry out um, what it is that you want to, the particular request that you're making, and that's where RBAC comes in. So I thought just to show you this, because this is a very, very important piece. Um, it, it might seem like it's uh, very straightforward, and that's actually a good thing because you don't want to have a platform or a tool that's getting in the way of what you're ultimately trying to achieve. But believe it or not, this is one of the most challenging things. And as I mentioned earlier, when I put out that poll, this ranked second because people understand that it is very difficult to manage multiple users accessing your Kubernetes clusters, and Rancher makes it very easy uh, to accomplish that. So I'm going to switch back to my slide deck. And as I mentioned earlier, we're covering the different dimensions of, secure, of securing our Kubernetes cluster. So we had looked at hosts, and then we moved on to securing um, the actual clusters themselves. And we looked at the different cluster components, and then we looked at cluster personas. And now we're looking more at the workload side of things. And so what you typically find in an enterprise context is that you'll have multiple workloads running side by side inside of Kubernetes clusters. Even if you have a single Kubernetes cluster model, um, you'll find that you might have your applications environment split in different namespaces, which would definitely be a good way of doing it. Now, namespaces um, do provide a level of isolation, but they're not um, inherently secure. Uh, by default, because of the Kubernetes networking model, um, all pods running on a Kubernetes cluster each have a unique IP address and are within the same site or range and are able to communicate regardless of the device or node that they find themselves on. So that means every single pod, regardless of the namespace is in, it's in, will be able to communicate. And that is a serious problem when trying to do things with a production cluster. You need to secure um, your workloads and make sure that pods are only able to access what they should be able to access and communicate with the relevant um, resources that they should be able to communicate with. And an excellent way of achieving that kind of security would be through network policies. Some of this might be a little bit repetitive to some of you, especially those of you who tuned in either to last week's session or when we had or when we had a dedicated Kubernetes masterclass to uh, that was dealing with multi-tenancy. But as I said, each of these sessions still has a degree of independence or is standalone to some to some effect. Uh, so people, so I still want to make sure that I cover this to a point that it would be valuable for those of you who have tuned in for the first time. 
And I want to show you an example of a network policy. So just in just so we're clear, network policies are unique Kubernetes objects in and of themselves, and they're used to control the ingress and egress network traffic uh, to and from pods on your workloads. And so um, it is very important if you're going to make use of network policies that you do install a CNI plugin that actually supports network policies. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to my editor because I want to show you a, a very basic example of a network policy. So what, what, what you should be seeing now, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. I just want to cater for those that uh, might not be seeing too clearly. As you can see over here, I have a manifest file for a network policy, and this is for an application that I'm calling e-commerce. And so you'll see over there that this is for a, is, this is going to be deployed inside a specific namespace called e-commerce. And the name, as usual, is arbitrary, but you want to give it something that actually makes sense for the particular context. Now, what's very important is network policies need to attach themselves to particular pods. And the way that you do that is under the spec configuration, you'll see over here, you're going to be working with pod selectors. And pod selectors work very similar to uh, the selectors with deployments as well as services where they identify specific pods based on the key value pairs or labels that are attached to specific pods. And so I have pods in my e-commerce namespace that have this key value pair role API. And so the network policy will be applied to every pod that has that particular label. But what's And what's very important in addition to that, as I was mentioning earlier, is you get to define the ingress and egress rules for uh, your workload. So this is how you secure um, your particular applications to make sure that a pod in one namespace is not able to speak to a pod in another namespace, or essentially just ensuring that applications that shouldn't be able to talk to each other um, are secured in that particular regard. And as you can see over here in the ingress and egress rules, um, you, defi you define from and to rules. And as you can see over here, um, there are different rules, by the way, and I have published an article in the SUSE and Rancher Community Network that goes into more detail with this with a practical example. Um, so if you feel like I rushed over this particular part, uh, please note it's because there are a number of other things that I'd like for us to go over. And um, don't feel shortchanged because this has also been covered in another masterclass session, but also there's an article in the SUSE and Rancher community. But I do want you to be able to see over here that um, this is how you would essentially specify the rules to make sure that, um, so in this case with the namespace selector, this means that any incoming traffic for pods um, that have this particular label will only be accepted um, if it is when, if it's inside of this specific namespace. And so the namespace as well will be identified with a particular label, which is a key value pair as well. And so tier e-commerce backend. So any pod running inside of the e-commerce backend namespace will be able to um, receive traffic uh, in this particular regard. And so the pod selector, on the other hand, is also another rule that I'm specifying. And this simply is an addition to that where I'm basically stating not only do I want to restrict traffic to the e-commerce backend, uh, to the e-commerce namespace, in addition to that, I want to make sure that the only pods that can communicate are the ones that have the specific label role API. Egress works in the exact same way. The only difference, obviously, is this is for outgoing traffic. So ingress is traffic going into a pod. Egress is traffic coming out of a pod. So uh, that's uh, securing workloads with network policies. And over here, I just have a diagram just to talk a, a little bit about um, what I was demonstrating earlier when I showed you Rancher and its uh, role-based access control centralized system and how that definitely helps when you're working with multiple cluster personas and so many different teams managing different downstream clusters. And it is especially useful because you might find that you have team A that has access to, let's say, downstream cluster alpha as well as downstream cluster Charlie. And uh, so making use of a tool like or platform like Rancher definitely mitigates the risks or error prone um, ten, uh, measures that can easily come into play if you are simply uh, relying on managing a number of manifest files. So you can do things through the GUI, which simplifies the process. But in addition to that, remember that you, you have access to those exact same YAML configuration files as well that they can be downloaded. And if you want to store them in a GitHub repository, you can also do that. Okay, so another um, aspect that we want to consider, um, especially now that we've basically been looking at the layer of um, cluster security or cluster hardening, some of you might be thinking there's so many different levels to that. And that is true. In fact, we're not even delving as deep as we possibly can with these different um, aspects. 
But uh, I think it is very important to note as well, and this is where uh, Rancher is also very helpful. Imagine if there was a way that you could essentially reuse the cluster configurations once you've gone through the life cycle or the process of hardening on those different levels and making sure you have the relevant cluster personas in place, the relevant RBAC permissions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So across the board, um, and essentially making use of what would be like a, what is essentially a template to launch your different Kubernetes clusters to avoid um, having uh, any configuration drift for the different environments or the different clusters that you would want to spin up. And you can make use of RKE templates inside of Rancher to help you accomplish that. And so you can create RKE templates um, or you can create a template from an existing cluster as well. And so that is extremely helpful if you wanna reuse configurations in the case that you have reached a point of optimization that you're comfortable with, and that essentially becomes the blueprint for all of your other clusters that you want to work with. Rancher is very helpful in that particular regard as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a short break to have a look at some of the questions that have come up, and we can address a few of those, as I mentioned. And in the case that there aren't um, any, we'll just proceed with the session, but I, I may not get to all of them, and we'll just be able to deal with those right at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing my slide deck. And I'm going to have a look at uh, some of the questions that have come up over here. So we have a question from Rohinton. I'm going to start with that one. For host hardening, do the Rancher products run some post install analysis and report on potential steps that could be taken? That is an excellent question, Rohinton. In fact, further down, we'll be able to look at some of the tools that you can make use of in Rancher to help you run scans on your Kubernetes cluster. Some of them have different levels of granularity. I'd probably need to just clarify the level of detail you want for host hardening. But certainly from a Kubernetes cluster perspective, uh, we'll be making use of CI CIS benchmark scanning, and there are other tools out there as well, a number of open source tools that you can use to scan uh, your clusters to make sure that they've reached a point of optimization or acceptability. And bear in mind, especially in the case of uh, benchmark scanning, which is uh, essentially managed by the Center of Information Security, uh, you want to make sure that it that those are it's essentially using a standard that you can trust. And in addition to that, if you're going to use any other cluster scanning tools, I think there's one like CubeScan. Um, just make sure that it's actually working with the standards that will have essentially been put in place by the CNCF um, and because they essentially maintain um, Kubernetes and make sure that um, your Kubernetes uh, version reaches or rather meets certain requirements and standards. So that's very important. There are a number of um, open source tools out there, but I'll also show you a very important one. We're going to be able to, I'll show you how to scan your a Kubernetes cluster using Rancher to see what uh, test it's passing um, and where it's failing, and it will be able to. We'll also be able to have a look at um, where we can mitigate um, a couple of those risks or failures that have come into play. So I hope that helps answer your question, Rohinton. If not, please just pop another question, or you can also drop it in the chat, and I can provide extra clarity. And I'm seeing over here a question from Shekhar. Um, in managed Kubernetes offerings like EKS, is the security of control plane and data plane taken care of by the provider? Excellent question, Shekhar, and that is absolutely correct. In fact, you don't have visibility of the control plane and the data plane. And so that is a bit of, that does um, hinder you when it comes to running scans on your on your Kubernetes cluster, you won't be able to scan the control plane and the data plane because those are essentially taken care of by the cloud provider. So in this context with EKS, it's AWS. But the good thing about that as well is you essentially have experts that are taking care of your clusters, uh, control plane and data plane to make sure that it is highly available, it is secure um, and optimized as it should be. So that is an, an, a level of trust. And again, look, if you're going to go with the model of a hosted cluster, there's probably a reason for that. In most cases, it's because teams want to leverage that uh, management um, aspect that has been taken care of um, and not have to do with the management overhead of taking care of the control plane and the data plane, which is hard work and complex. But if you're in a context where you're at a company where you want complete visibility and control over that, then that is um, then that would be the you know then you would opt for another solution in that case. Okay, and I have a question here from Harold. Um, what is the best security practices to determine to isolate by namespace? Uh, versus separate clusters, right? That's an excellent question, Harold. Um, so I should state over here that um, you're going to have different uh, models when it comes to, you know, the multi-cluster paradigm or pattern, which is a model in and of itself. And so 
you might find that in your context, um, it could be that a company is actually deploying the same application to a single Kubernetes cluster, but that application has different environments such as dev, staging and production and each of those is operating in a different namespace and so they could have that same model with several different clusters so basically it's a cluster per application so an application will have its own cluster and the different environments will be in the different namespaces and then another model uh, when it comes to clusters um, or multiple clusters would be uh, a cluster per environment in which case you would have a dedicated cluster for the dev environment of a specific application, another cluster for the staging or test environment for a specific application, and production would be very similar. Now, uh, depending on what your requirements are, that is essentially what is going to drive the model that you opt for. Now, uh, keep in mind, in the case that you opt for the first one that I spoke about, which is uh, cluster per application, um, a good practice uh, would be something that I actually already touched on is making sure that you make use of network security policies. So network secu security policies help you um, ensure that the workloads in their respective namespaces only have communication with what they should be communicating with. In addition to that, I also spoke about role-based access control. So make sure that the pods that are running in their respective namespaces are making use of a specific service account, and that service account is attached to a specific role, which remember works at the scope of a specific namespace. And that role should detail the permissions that your pods should have. So those would be some of the best practices to be keeping in to be keeping in mind. And I should state, if you're gonna go with the class, the cluster per environment model, such as dev for its having its own cluster, that's a really good one and helps definitely increase the chances of more security because with the with the previous one that I just mentioned, you might find that um, you know there's a higher risk because you're, you're running both your production workload as well as your de development workload on the exact same Kubernetes cluster. But if they're on separate clusters, that increases the security. But there's also another risk there from a configuration um, drift uh, perspective. So you want to make sure that you're still achieving alignment and consistency with these different clusters as well. OK, so I hope that answers your question, Harold. If it doesn't, please, um, uh, to, to everyone, actually, with that um, that asked the question, uh, just pop in the chat if I did if I wasn't clear enough, or if you want to ask another question, use the ask a question section as, uh, specifically. So we're going to continue now, and then we'll come back. So Shekar, I have seen your question. Don't worry about that. And so um, we're going to continue now and um, proceed with the rest of the session. So once again, I will share my slide deck. Great, so you should all be seeing my slide deck now. And the next thing we are going to cover is secrets and certificate management. And if I remember correctly, when I had a look at the polls, it looked like um, this was, uh, most people uh, responded that this was the aspect that they found most challenging and rightly so. Um, it is not easy. And you'll probably find that um, what I share might be a little bit underwhelming for some of you, because like I said, look, it, we can only spend so much time on the different aspects of this, but I certainly wanna make sure that there's enough value for you to go away with. So we'll start off by looking at certificate management. And so this is actually a continuation of what we spoke about earlier when I was um, uh, sharing with you how to secure uh, your API server and the other control plane components, as well as the etcd um, data store, or rather the, uh, the data store for your Kubernetes cluster. And so uh, for starters, it is very important to understand what I mentioned right at the start as well. Kubernetes is not secure by default. And in addition to that, it doesn't have a native solution for certificate issuing and management. There are some excellent tools out there, thankfully, like Cert Manager and Cert Manager. Um, you will have to start off by configuring a particular issuer. And in addition to that, um, you can add a number of different configurations. Uh, there's a lot that um, we could talk about with Cert Manager, but it is an excellent tool that really does help. I remember a couple of weeks back, in, a couple of weeks back in the SUSE and Rancher community, someone actually asked me about certificate rotation. Bear in mind that this is something that you could do manually, but uh, if you make use of Cert Manager, you can also configure it to automatically rotate your certificates uh, for your Kubernetes uh, cluster components as well. So very important. In addition to that, there are other examples that you can make use of. There's EZRSA, OpenSSL, and CFSSL. 
And with each of these tools, you can manually generate certificates and actually deploy them and make use of them in your Kubernetes cluster. And something that I mentioned earlier as well that is also very important is you have different Kubernetes installers and different Kubernetes installers will actually have different mechanisms for generating certificates as well. And so there are different solutions that are available for um, for actually achieving this goal. So that, remember what I mentioned right at the start that you wanna make sure you understand what the points of vulnerability are, what the solution is for that uh, particular vulnerability and how to apply them. And so um, this is the application aspect of it. So make sure you understand that you're making use of a tool either like Cert Manager, Easy RSA, Open SSL or CF SSL in order to generate your certificates make sure that you actually have a system in place in order for rotation um if you know and there are also means of you making use of your own certificate some of you might be working in an enterprise context where you want to uh, where you will actually want to bring your own certificates to be made use of in uh, your particular kubernetes cluster and so these tools help simplify the process but there's no escaping the hard work there is configuration that needs to be uh, that needs to be done. But the important thing is to recognize that it's something that is necessary. You understand the solution and you know how to apply it. And then the next one is secret management. And uh, this one might be a little bit contentious uh, because uh, secrets are, well, in the context of Kubernetes, it's a little disappointing when you consider the level of security that they provide you with, especially given what their name is, uh, secrets. So for those of you that are new to Kubernetes, uh, secrets are how you essentially, are one of the two ways of storing configuration data inside of your Kubernetes cluster. The other approach would be config maps. They work in the exact same way. Secrets on the other hand are for storing sensitive data such as passwords, tokens, certificates, and SSH keys as well. And so you can have your pods make use of the values of these particular secrets by mounting them either as volumes or mounting them as environment variables. And so inside of my introduction uh, to Kubernetes class, I demonstrate how to mount them with environment variables, but bear in mind that this, is, uh, this can actually be uh, a, a major security risk if those environment variables are made available to the wrong kinds of applications. So just make sure you have a good system in place for making use of your secrets. Now, um, as I've mentioned over here, secrets are natively insecure, even with base 64 encoding. And if you think about it, you want to be able to store all your Kubernetes resources inside of a Git repository. Now, when you think about secrets, well, you're basically making it uh, quote unquote public, even with a private repository, um, because if they're, if that repository is essentially compromised then your secret values are stored in there, even if they're base 64 encoded, well, it's very easy to base 64 decode them. And so there, uh, there's a solution that I do wanna make you aware of for those of you that might not be um, familiar with this, there's a tool known as Sealed Secrets. And so with Sealed Secrets, this helps uh, solve the particular problem, especially because you wanna be able to store your secrets in some kind of Git repository. And so Sealed Secrets have uh, two parts. Uh, they have a command line tool known as kubeseal, and there's also a Sealed Secrets controller, but essentially they help you encrypt uh, this, uh, the, the sensitive data that you're storing inside of your secrets. So even if someone was to gain access to these particular uh, Kubernetes manifest or configuration files, um, they wouldn't be able to decrypt that. So this is very important. It makes use of custom resource definitions um, and communicates with the secrets controller uh, to generate the encryption key and decrypt the sealed secrets into secrets that will be used by the pod. So check out sealed secrets if you haven't um, heard of them before uh, and you can read through the documentation as well as see how to apply those. But that is very important because remember, secrets are um, natively insecure. So this is a great solution to have a look at. And because it's more likely that you will be having to make use of secrets because storing configuration data inside of your Kubernetes cluster for your the different environments and to drive how your application behaves is, is something that is very, very common, especially with large applications. Okay, so now we come to cluster security and conformance, and this is going to be the last section that we'll cover, and it'll be uh, very much uh, related or tied to something that I think it was Rohinton who asked about this. And um, as I mentioned, there are different tools that you can make use of to essentially vet or test to see if your Kubernetes cluster is reaching the right standards or requirements um, in its different components from a security perspective. 
And as I mentioned earlier as well, there are different open source tools, but it's very important if you're going to be making use of open source tools that don't have a lot of support and a lot of support might be a little bit subjective. Some of you might consider that based on a thousand stars. Some of you, it might be 500 plus stars. The important thing is to have a look at the issues as well. Have a look at the support and uh, just uh, because you don't want to be making use of a solution that isn't well supported. And more than that, um, doesn't actually help you achieve the main thing you're trying to achieve, which is to ensure that the different components of your Kubernetes cluster are secure based on CNCF standards. Now there's an excellent tool known as Sonoboy, um, by, and this is in a VMware GitHub repository. So you can have a look at this and this helps you to essentially carry out conformance tests for your Kubernetes cluster to make sure that it, um, it meets the relevant requirements specific to storage features, performance tests, scaling tests, provider tests, et cetera. And so Sonoboy is an excellent tool. And so you can essentially install this inside of the host of your Kubernetes cluster and run the relevant um, run the relevant commands. And after that, you can then um, uninstall it or, or remove it. And that would be similar if you're going to make use of other scanning tools. You probably have to be installing them on the hosts directly uh, in order to carry out the relevant scans and then remove them afterwards. Now, a very important one is CIS benchmarking, which is the last one that we're going to come to now. And if you want to test whether your Kubernetes cluster is deployed and configured according to the Kubernetes benchmark developed by the Center for Internet Security, this is the tool to use. It is Kubebench. And you can install install Kubebench to run against both your uh, control plane and your data plane to ensure that it meets these checks and that it passes in these particular regards. Now, um, remember in the context of what we're actually looking at here of doing things at scale, that can become a very tedious process to do that for multiple Kubernetes clusters. And so with the use of Rancher, you can essentially make use of what is known as Rancher CIS Benchmark, which is an app that still makes use of Kubebench under the hood. And in addition to that, also utilizes Sonoboy, which we just spoke about. In order for you to still check that your cluster meets uh, the CIS Kubernetes Benchmark compliance. And so what I'm gonna do now is gonna switch back to Rancher. Some of you might hear a helicopter passing over, so don't mind that. Okay, so I'm back inside of Rancher and I only have a single Kubernetes cluster that I'm managing. It is an EKS cluster called Alpha. So I'm just gonna click on Alpha over there. Now, if you wanna make use of Kubebench, you would essentially come to the apps and marketplace. And um, inside of here, you'll see that there are different um, applications that you can install. So the one that you wanna install is CIS Benchmark. So I've already installed that. And then the next step uh, to make use of this is to just scroll down over here. You'll see the CIS Benchmark. So you simply click on that. And in order for you to create a scan, and bear in mind, you can also uh, run scheduled scans that would actually be very good as well so that you make sure that you're continuously scanning them. Um, and so you just head over here to create. And so this is where, you, as you can see over here, you can run um, a scheduled scan, um, but I'm just gonna run one, uh, have it run once rather, and you can see there are different profiles over here. And uh, the really cool thing about this is when uh, CIS benchmark application or the Rancher CIS benchmark application rather is installed on your cluster, it will typically be able to detect the profile that it should be using for that particular cluster. And as you can see over here, you can also configure it to scan for, um, in terms of how you want it to scan for the state for warning results. And so, um, once uh, once again, something that is really, really cool about Rancher, all of the actions that you're carrying out, even though you're using a GUI, which simplifies the process and makes things easier for you, um, you can still, you'll still have access to all the relevant YAML configuration files uh, that you can make use of and store in a Git repository. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another scan as you can see over here, and this takes a little bit of time. And so while that scan is running, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, click on the previous one that I actually run, and you can see over here, the state is, uh, is currently failed. And what's interesting about this as well is that this is a brand new Kubernetes cluster that I, uh, that I created or provisioned, so I hadn't made any changes to it. So I hope this will already get you kind of thinking about, man, so that you definitely need to do some work in case there are some of you that might have been thinking, well, I mean, why can I just go ahead and make use of my Kubernetes cluster that I created inside of um, a cloud um, environment uh, for production? There's still a lot of work that you need to do. And as you can see over here, total number of tests that were run, four, only four passed, and there were 48 fails over there. And you can see a warning over there. I'm gonna click on the scan. And you'll see that there are different, um, you, get, you basically get different details about the failure that was run. And you can also see, uh, rather you can also see the details of um, the particular hosts that were, um, 
the particular host that the tests were run against. And so this also answers your question, Ro Rohinton. So you can see these are the particular EC2 instances where these tests were run. And you can see over there, the description is ensure that the prox, uh, this is for the test, ensure that the proxy cube config file permissions are set to 644 or more restrictive. And you can see it also gives you the particular uh, remediation, which is absolutely awesome. And so it will be a little bit of work to go through all of these, but it is of the utmost importance, especially for your Kubernetes clusters um, that are going to be running in a production environment. But this is super important and is very useful, especially when you're doing things at scale. What would typically take you a while if you're going to be making use of Kubebench and installing it on all of the different nodes or, or host machines in order to run these tests, you can make use of an application inside of Rancher to easily install it, configure it in a certain way if you want, because you're basically using using Helm charts if you want to configure the values for that. But in addition to that, um, a scan is something that would simply be a couple of clicks and you can also run scheduled um, scans on your Kubernetes clusters. So I'm going to switch over to my slide deck and that brings us to a close. And so as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different things that we touched on and we could delve deeper into each of these different aspects. But I certainly hope that there was a lot of value that you were able to get, at least even in understanding what I said our main goal was to, to be able to identify the different points of vulnerability, what the solutions would be for those vulnerabilities and how to actually apply them and apply them at scale and how Rancher fits into the picture with managing multiple downstream clusters and how it helps you actually achieve those main goals. So I'm going to stop sharing my slide deck now. And I'm going to have a look at the questions that have been added. And in addition to that, I'm just going to make active a couple of more polls. So please do provide feedback on that. Uh, it'd be very useful just to know whether or not this session was actually helpful for you. And in addition to that, I really am interested to know if you were able to identify some solutions that were are helpful for you in your particular context. So um, I'm and once again, uh, please uh, do check out Rancher in the case that you haven't. It is very useful for managing multiple Kubernetes clusters and helping you be able to actually achieve the different things that I demonstrated um, over here. Okay, so I'm going to head over to the ask a question section. Um, and I can see over here, I'm going to start on the demo. Can you provide an example scan output with the 48, fa 48 failures out of 53 tests? Excellent question, Tim. So I actually did show that. I hope that uh, covers that. If Unless there's something else in particular that you wanted uh, clarity on, and I'll be happy to switch over back and just share my, my screen once again and show you that. Um, but I'd also encourage... Um, I'd encourage each of you to actually test that out, spin up a new Kubernetes cluster and um, uh, install Rancher on it, and then spin up another cluster where you would essentially be deploying your workloads. So even if it's just for a short amount of time and then run those CIS scans to see what the failures would be, because that also starts helping you understand the additional points of vulnerability based on the standards or benchmark that has been set by the Center for Internet um, Security. Okay, Shakar, I'm going to look at your question over here. Is it uh, two-way SSL? Do we have key stores and trust stores? Um, okay, so I'm going to assume that you're referring to what I was uh, speaking about earlier when I was referring to the encryption with um, public key infrastructure and certificates um, across the board with the different cluster um, components. And when, if you recall, there was actually that list that I was referring to. And um, that list is, you know, it's it's a little bit um, mundane to go through it in a particular session or presentation like this, like this. But I definitely touched on a number of those issues. And the reason I showed it to you is so that you can understand that you're making sure that you're authenticating uh, uh, both ways. And so, yes, there are. Um, there are key stores uh, that uh, would essentially be generated where when you're storing the when you're generating the certificates rather. And so, as I mentioned earlier as well, that uh, you would basically have different ways of achieving that with the different tools that are provided, such as easy RSA, or if you're going to use cert manager, just remember with cert manager, you need to start off by configuring the relevant issuer. And so it's going to depend on the tool that you're making use of. And in addition to that, there are different Kubernetes installers and the different installers have different ways of actually helping you accomplish that. So the important thing is to make sure you understand the problem, uh, the solution for that problem and how to apply it. So Shekhar, I hope that was helpful. If there's a lack of clarity, please do let me know. And remember, it is TSL transport layer security that we're trying to achieve um, within the context of our Kubernetes cluster, uh, just to provide that clarity. I saw you said SSL. So it's transport layer security that we want to achieve and from a communication perspective. So I have another uh, question over here. 
a joint middle of the session. Can I get the recorded session? Absolutely. The session will be available to you on demand afterwards, regardless of the time that you joined. Um, if you if you run into any issues with accessibility, please feel free to reach out to me in the SUSE and Rancher community as well, and I'll certainly be able to help you out in that particular regard. Thanks, Simon. I see you dropped an answer over there. Excellent. Okay, so another question here from Tim. Can I use Rancher to monitor existing Kubernetes clusters across different cloud Kubernetes providers in a neutral manner, i.e. all results can be repeated manually uh, without Rancher? Looking at it at auditing scenarios where we would not provide our tools or environments to review results of previous work. Thanks. Okay, um, let me just uh, have another look at that. It was a loaded question. Definitely looks like a good one, though. So I'll try and, I'll try and take it apart. Tim, if I do not answer it correctly, please... Um, please do let me know. Uh, so yes, you can use Rancher to monitor existing Kubernetes clusters across different cloud providers. Uh, if you, in a neutral manner, um, you're essentially, um, it, maybe you can provide a bit of clarity there, but just so you know that the, what I demonstrated was actually an EKS cluster, which is running inside of AWS, of course, because that's AWS's specific um, service for hosted Kubernetes. Um, however, you can run the ex you can run the CIS benchmark scans in the exact same way for GKE and Azure and other um, cloud providers like Ali Cloud, etc. Uh, because remember, that is the beauty of Kubernetes. It is um, um, infrastructure agnostic, and so the scans that get run. Uh, can be run even in, in a local context. You could actually run those same CIS scans on a local Kubernetes cluster, as well as in a cloud environment, which is absolutely excellent. And you're dealing with the same standards for C, uh, which have essentially been set by CIS. So I'm just gonna see in um, the other part of this, looking at auditing scenarios where we would not provide our tools or environments to review results of previous work. So I'm not sure I understand that particular part, Tim. So please, you might need to provide a bit of clarity, but I'm gonna give it a bash anyway. And you've actually reminded me another very important topic, which we, did, we didn't actually touch on in this session because security is so comprehensive. Auditing, you wanna make sure you know exactly who did what um, and what they did it to um, inside of the context of your Kubernetes clusters. So you can enable um, auditing as well, uh, making use of uh, with Rancher as well. And so the logging will be a little bit uh, specific to the Kubernetes cluster as well. So you might find if you're running um, an EKS cluster, I'll use that example because that's the one I'm working with um, in the AWS environment, the logs will be pushed to CloudWatch, which is the logging service inside of AWS. But the nice thing is you'll have access to those logs to see, um, and you can, you can enable that actually from the Rancher side of things um, to ensure that you're able to actually track um, what the different people um, were actually doing on your Kubernetes cluster. And it works the same way as well for uh, the pods that are accessing the Kubernetes uh, control plane API as well. I see, Tim, you've commented over there in past master classes, many features needed to import clusters into Rancher to take full advantage. Um, yep, yeah, so you're right over there, Tim. So I should state that um, not every cluster in a cloud um, environment um, is run from a full lifecycle perspective. EKS, GKE, and AKS are. So there's full lifecycle management from a rancher perspective, but with the others, that is not the case. Uh, so thanks for actually mentioning that particular comment over there. But please let me know, uh, Tim, if I did address your question um, as best as I possibly can. If there was something that I wasn't clear on, you can feel free to do so. We still do have a little bit of time. And I see Dax over there, I believe you can use Kubebench um, to scan clusters without importing into rancher. Absolutely. Um, so I, maybe I wasn't too clear on that, but thank you so much for posting that Dax in the chat. I see over there, please remember Kubebench is a is an open source tool that you can make use of on any Kubernetes cluster. So uh, the be again, the benefit of just using it in Rancher is um, Rancher CIS um, benchmark tool is, is basically making use of Kubebench under the hood. And it's just that it makes it easier to run these scans on multiple downstream clusters because we're thinking of things of doing things at scale because the process of actually running those scans with Kubebench by yourself on each of the respective um, hosts on your different Kubernetes clusters can easily become a very long process and you're likely to carry out, you're likely to make a mistake when you're doing things manually as well. So that is why we encourage an automated way that works well um, at scale. Now, look, if you happen to just be working with maybe three Kubernetes clusters or two Kubernetes clusters, that might not be a big deal for installing Kubebench, um, or SSHing into the relevant nodes and then running Kubebench on them. So if that's what works for you, then you should totally do that. Again, so I just hope it's clear that when I was speaking in the context of doing things in a scalable way. All right, so I'm gonna give it a, a, a few more minutes just to see if anyone does actually have some additional questions uh, to the ones that have actually been asked. 
Um, and once again, uh, please do give some feedback um, in the polls. I certainly hope that this session was helpful. It is a very comprehensive topic. Feel free to reach out to me in the Sousa and Rancher community if you want to have a conversation further about the different things that I spoke about in this session. In addition to that, um, if there are other aspects that you actually want to chat about that weren't addressed in this session, we can still have a conversation about that. And in addition to that, we can also talk about um, you can feel free to actually raise it in a public context on the Susan Rancher community, you know, pop it in a quick post and ask, hey, um, other than these particular items, and you can actually reference the things that I've spoken about in this masterclass session, you could basically phrase the question as what do you think are some other things that um, need to be considered when it comes to securing your Kubernetes clusters at scale. But um, thank you very much to all of you for actually tuning into this session. Thank you so much for the engagement. There were a lot of great questions. Once again, if there's a lack of clarity on anything, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to other um, people from the Sousa and Rancher community. Um, and uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, engage with you and carry the conversation over there. Uh, for those of you that are new to our Kubernetes Masterclass sessions or new to the Sousa and Rancher community, and you don't have a lot of context about what's going on in the community, we do have um, a couple of other awesome things. There's on-demand material that you can make use of. And in addition to that, we have a new up and running Rancher course that is running throughout October and November. It just started last week, so it's not too late to join. The material for last week's session is available on demand, so you can watch the first session, which is for the most part was administration and then exploring the Rancher architecture under the hood. Tomorrow, we're gonna be looking at installing Rancher um, and making use of Rancher desktop for that, or if you wanna use Docker. Um, so there's some great stuff to be um, checking out, and I think that will be very useful to a lot of you. For myself, to all of you, goodbye, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for tuning into the session. I see someone just asked again about the on-demand uh, session. This uh, will be available on this exact same link um, for this particular session. But if you're actually referring to the up and running Rancher class uh, inside of the Sousa and Rancher community, head over to the course material and you'll be able to see the recording from there. If you have any confusion, please feel free to reach out to me. Once again, thank you so much for being an awesome audience and for being so engaging. Uh, Till next week, we'll be covering um, Istio, so service meshes and the importance that they, uh, the, the important role that they fulfill in the context of um, Kubernetes clusters and doing things at scale and how you can make use of Rancher to configure that as well. Bye.